Welcome to Let's Hear It. Let's Hear It is a podcast for and about the field of foundation and nonprofit communications, produced by its two co hosts, Eric Brown and Kirk Brown. No relation. Well said, Eric. And I'm Kirk. And I'm Eric. The podcast is sponsored by the College Futures Foundation which envisions a California where post-secondary education advances equity and unlocks upward mobility now and for generations to come. To learn more, visit collegefutures.org. You can find Let's Hear It on any podcast subscription platform. You can find us online at letshearitcast.com. You can find us on LinkedIn and, yes, even on Instagram. And if you like the show, please, please, please rate us on Apple Podcasts so that more people can find us. So let's get on to the show. Welcome in. Welcome back. You found us. We found you. We're here. It's another episode of Let's Hear It. How you doing, Mr. Brown? Welcome in. It's, you're going to make a wonderful Walmart greeter one of these days, I'm Mr. Mr. Brown. The barker on the street corner, and we've got a pretty <laughs> inexpensive five and dime for you. The price is free. <laughs> it's a wonderful deal, isn't it? Just your time, and I have to say, you're never going to get this time back, and you're glad you're giving it to us, because we've got a good <laughs> conversation ahead. Let's head to the barbershop. What do we got ahead, like, Mr. Brown? Like the car talk, guys. You've wasted another great hour of your day. <laughs> That's right. I spoke with John Hoffman, who's the director of, a co-director, rather, of the new film Barber of Little Rock, which has just been nominated for an Academy Award for a documentary short film. John is the co-director of this film with Christine Turner who sadly was unable to have the conversation with us, so I spoke to John. This film is one of those, it's a short documentary short, nominated for an Oscar. Some of you may remember that John Hoffman directed this film called The Antidote, (laughs) and he and his co-director were on as guests a while back. (laughs) And he's back because, A, it's a fabulous film, and it really does have a huge implication for philanthropy and nonprofits and communications and all that stuff. It actually really fits with what we do on this podcast. Yes, it does. And it is under currently under consideration. So if there are any any stray Academy members out there, I urge you to see the film. And to, and then, of course, I'm sure you will vote for it for Best Documentary Short. Yeah, let's be clear. It's Oscar season. We're trying to curry favor and curry votes for The Barber of Little Rock. Uh, this is uh, directed by John Hoffman and Christine Turner. This is John Hoffman talking about The Barber of Little Rock on Let's Hear It. Let's listen to Eric and John, and we'll come back. Welcome to Let's Hear It. My guest today, back for a repeat performance, is John Hoffman, the co-director of the new film, The Barber of Little Rock, which has just been nominated for an Academy Award for Documentary Short Film. John, I cannot tell you how delighted I am for you now and how thrilled I am to speak to you about this film. So I should point out that you are the co-director of this film with Christine Turner, who was unable to join us for this conversation. But we wanted to have it now so that we could put this episode out while your film is still under Oscar consideration because every vote counts. John, thank you so much for joining us on Let's Hear It. Oh, Eric, I can't thank you enough. And on behalf of Christine and the entire team that made this film, it's an honor to be with you. I love talking with you. I always love talking with you. We've known each other for a long time. And so to be talking about this film at this moment, for me, a sort of crazy moment of being nominated for an Oscar, it's, it's a lot to process. I'm very happy about it. But to be able to have this Klieg light shown on our film and for it to bring attention to what the film is about is, or I should say, added attention, special attention, is really special. Well, let's just dive right in. First of all, congratulations on this film. It is a beautiful movie that is it is successful on so many levels. It's great storytelling. It's great character study. And as you say, it puts a highlight on an issue that I think is far underappreciated. And we can get at, get into that a little more deeply later on. But just tell us a little bit about the Barber of Little Rock. Who is he and what do we need to know? So the Barber of Little Rock is a man named Arlo Washington. And Arlo is a barber who is probably in his mid-40s, black man in Little Rock, Arkansas. He uh, has spent his whole life in Little Rock. And he became a barber when he was in his late teens after his mother died, leaving him with responsibilities of two younger sisters and finding his way in the world. And Arlo 
uh, started cutting hair and within a short time became uh, successful supporting himself. And he eventually opened up a barber college, Washington Barber College, where you learn in the film that since its founding has sent 1,500 barbers out in the world, into the world to make a life and a living as a barber. And then in 2000, starting in 2008, he started making loans, informal loans to people. But in 2014, and you'll- I'll interrupt for a second. He made loans to people. People just come to him and ask for money. Yeah. So barbers and barber shops uh, play a very big role in the Black community. They are the relationship between barber and uh, his or her customers is a very strong one. And the atmosphere of uh, barbershops is a very, very valued, treasured place for, particularly for black men. And it's a place where a lot of conversation goes on, a lot of fun happens. And the barber is a really highly respected and revered person in the community. And Arlo, like many, had a a solid um, financial footing and his customers were facing hardship, needed a loan to keep his car going so he could get to a job interview and and these stories. And Arlo would give somebody a hundred bucks, they would pay him back. And he came to realize, he tells the story in the film, he came to realize that these small dollar loans were having an outsized effect on the lives of the people that he was you know, interacting with, his customers' lives. And he is inspired to become a banker, to, to start- As one does, right? As one does, but not to become a banker in the way that we might think. Arlo opened up a nonprofit loan, and he has been doing this in a, in, a, in a very meaningful way since he uh, became Community Development Financial Institution, which is a program created by Bill Clinton in his administration, and it's administered by the Fed, and he got his license to be a CDFI in 2016. And Arlo has changed thousands of people's lives, small business loans, personal loans, and he has brought access to capital to a community that has been systemically cut out of our financial system. Not only that, though, it's interesting. Arlo has become kind of a one-person bridge span in that somebody comes in for a loan and they'll he'll ask him a bunch of questions like, oh, what are you going to use the money for? What kind of business do you have? And how do you think about how you do your business? And how are you thinking about marketing and all these other things? And pretty soon, it sounds to me, and I could be extrapolating from the film, but he really becomes a business consultant, as well as a source of of money that many people take incredibly for granted. These are not just business loans. They're loans so that somebody can get their car running again, or they're the things that people who normally have access to credit can just, you put it on your credit card if you don't have the cash. And and many folks, they don't have that opportunity. But Arlo is kind of like a one-stop shop for how to think about building a community. Can you, can you say a little bit more some of the examples that, that you, I'm sure you, since you shot hundreds and hundreds of hours of film, you must have so many stories. It was a very, very moving experience anytime you were with Arlo, because as Arlo would arrive at the first branch of People Trust Loan Fund, which is a shipping container, in the parking lot of the barber college, converted shipping container into an office. Whether it was there or it was downtown Little Rock or it was in the parking lot of the branch in North Little Rock, Arlo steps out of his car and he can't walk 10 feet without someone coming up to him and saying, hey, Arlo, can I talk to you for a second? The level of unmet need in the Black community of Little Rock is something which is evident to the eye as you are moving through the community. But the stories that we're talking about are unfolding. As I say, he can't walk 10 feet and he can't not talk to people who are in front of him. It's part of his character. He must, he is, he is someone who is always in the moment. 
that he is responding and giving the person who's in front of him, whether he knows them or not, his full attention. We're talking about a kind of financial institution that Clinton recognized needs to exist because in many parts of this country, whether it's because they are rural or because they are urban and there are communities of color that have been historically excluded from the, from the financial system. And the ways in which people are evaluated for being a low or a high risk for a loan, that the metrics that the financial system, the main financial system uses, th these people are cut out. They are excluded from the financial system. So this is a kind of, what you're talking about, Liz, when Arlo is talking to people about what is their job, what is their business plan, and what, are they, you know, what kind of business are they trying to operate, or what do they need their loan for? This is high touch banking. This is Arlo and his remarkable team using very, very different metrics. They're not using you know, your credit score to evaluate the, the, the risk, someone's risk for a loan. They are, do you have a bank account? Do you have a job? How much do you make? These are very logical things to ask, but your typical banker is only, their starting point is a credit score. If you have been cut out of the financial system, you don't have a credit score. Um, you don't have an opportunity to build up a credit rating. And so Arlo has to use other metrics. And Clinton understood this. And so the CDFI program, Community Development Financial Institutions, were designed, the legislation was written so that someone like Arlo can evaluate risk in very different ways. We can get into the history of how this came about, but it is deemed really the only program that the federal government has created since Reconstruction that enables Black-owned financial institutions to succeed. Arlo, as you point out, he graduated from high school. His mother passes away, and he goes right into cutting hair and doesn't have an MBA from Stanford. He's completely, it seems, self-taught. To what does he attribute his own ability to navigate this, for m most people, incredibly arcane system of getting money from very, very powerful places and distributing it into places that didn't and don't have that kind of power? What kind of magical herbs was he sprinkled with? Or like, what is it about Arlo and how does he, how do you think he, he, talks about how he got to this place. I, I hope people see the film. And I want to point out the film is a New Yorker film. So it can be screened at uh, newyorker.com and it can be screened on YouTube. So there's no barrier to entry. People can find them what they have a computer. They have access to the internet. And you will see Arlo is a man who just moves forward. He is just a shark that is constantly swimming forward. And he is incredibly smart guy, when Arlo started making these loans and this idea that he had to create a loan fund, to create, just to start making any kinds of business loans, his uncle was working as a security guard at a CDFI in Chicago. And he says, Arlo, you show up at the up a CDFI. Arlo goes to the computer and he downloads the legislation and he reads the legislation. And I don't know if you or the people who listen to your podcast have ever really read legislation, but it's, it's actually quite interesting and it's quite illuminating. And the legislation lays it all out. It gave Arlo basically all the instructions of how to open up a CDFI. And when you talk to people who work in this field, who study this field, there's a woman named Donna Gambrell. And Donna was the first director of the CDFI program appointed, appointed by Clint 40 years ago to create this program. And she's now the president of the National Association of Black Bankers. And it's Donna who introduced us to Arlo. I was watching a Zoom conversation between Bill Clinton and Donna talking about when they started this program 40 years ago. And Donna describes Arlo as really the living embodiment of the legislation as it was written. This high-touch banking, this deep relationship with the people you're making loans to, 
to really understand their lives and to give them the training that they need to have to not only understand about having this debt that they have to pay back, but to look at their business plans and to really help them to open up or expand their small businesses. So CDFIs have been around for a long time now, and many of them, as Donna says, and as Arlo says, are you have to take an elevator to get there. <laughs> but Arlo is in that shipping container. And that's the way, that's the spirit of what they were meant to be. Well, we're going to take a very quick break. We'll be back with John Hoffman, the co-director of this, I mean, really incredible film, Barber of Little Rock, co-director with Christine Turner. And, uh, and we'll talk more about documentary film, why it matters. And we'll talk more about this, this issue, this thing that we have to deal with, the racial wealth gap. So we'll be right back with John Hoffman after this. You're listening to Let's Hear It, a podcast about foundation and nonprofit communications hosted by Eric Brown and Kirk Brown. If you're enjoying this episode, you may just be a rule breaker. Tune in to Break Fake Rules, a new limited series podcast with Glenn Gallich, CEO of the Stupsky Foundation. Hear from leaders in philanthropy, nonprofits, government, media, and more to learn about challenges they've overcome by breaking fake rules and which rules we should commit to breaking together. We are also sponsored by the Conrad Prebis Foundation. Check out their amazingly good podcast. And we're not just saying that. Stop and talk. Hosted by Prebis Foundation CEO Grant Oliphant. You can find them at stopandtalkpodcast.com. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to Let's Hear It. I'm speaking with John Hoffman, my, my friend, co-director of the Oscar-nominated film for documentary short film, The Barber of Little Rock. You've found this phenomenal character who tells a really important story about how communities have been left out of the banking system, but not just the banking system. It's what that banking system does. And Arlo in the film says that, that money is like blood. It circulates, you know, blood circulates through the body. It keeps you healthy. It builds you up. It allows you to do the things you need to do. And, and money is the same thing. As it circulates through the economy, it provides opportunities. It gives people the chance to invest, to try new things, to be creative, to expand, to build their community. And, and yet our system has systematically, historically denied swaths of our population the chance to be able to do that. The fact that CDFIs are frankly little known that there we have this sort of there is this one frankly small tool to use is amazing what you're doing is to try and tell that story where do you see this going what have you heard back from folks who have seen the film do you think that there's this potential and we're getting into the power of storytelling frankly to begin to make real headway in this in this issue I have the great privilege as a documentary filmmaker to immerse myself with every film into a whole new world, a new topic, a whole new culture. And one of the things that unifies the films that I've been making throughout my career is that I'm very, very committed to my films offering solutions to the complex problems that the film is illuminating. And so, when Christine and I were given this opportunity and this task of making a film that's looking at the racial wealth gap, that was the challenge. There was no definition beyond that. So you start reading, you start talking, you start opening your mind to a whole, you know, new worlds. And along the way, we were pointed to a book called The Color of Money, which is by a woman named Mercer Barrara was at UC Irvine. And it's about the history of black banking in this country um, since Reconstruction. And it is about the series of failures in, in, that, in that history. And she is the one who points to CDFIs as the only thing the federal government has done that you can uh, say is working and is you know, by design, the concept of design is is creating financial opportunity 
and stable financial opportunity in the communities where these CDF buys. It's about $10 billion a year. It's a drop in the bucket when the racial wealth gap is literally a trillion dollars. I never heard of CDFIs before. Christina never heard of CDFIs before. We start, you know, immersing ourselves in this, and we find that there's really some interesting storytelling opportunity here, and that these high touch that means that you're going to be following and, and having the opportunity to see relationships. You could possibly follow the money. You could see what happens when somebody who has been cut out of the financial system now has access to capital. And can follow his or her dream, can open up that small business that he or she knows is going to work. And you can see how that changes lives, okay? Not only the life of the person getting the loan and starting the business, but then the people that he or she employs and how that access to capital, the lifeblood of the economy, it does build opportunity. It builds community. Okay, so that's the grand opportunity that we saw ourselves talk for ourselves. And it is the opportunity to, if if successful, point to a solution. So Donna Gambrell, mentioned earlier, who was the first director of the program for Clinton, says you got to be this guy Arlo, this barber, he's got the shipping container in the parking lot of his, you know, barber college. So we meet Arlo over Zoom. This is the time of COVID. Um, and we shot throughout COVID over a year's period. And Arlo is a really charismatic guy. He's a handsome, charismatic, um, incredibly compassionate guy. Um, and you, along the way, we met wonderful people. Lincola, who's a beautician, who is now getting her barber's license, who wants to open up her own you know, barbershop. And you see her graduate from barber college and get her first chair. Okay. You meet Terrence, who is a guy who was managing a Jiffy Lube franchise. New owner comes in, previous owner sells the franchise, new owner of the franchise lets everyone go because it's cheaper to have all new employees than to pay the higher salaries of existing employees. Okay. So Terrence loses his job. He's been managing Jiffy Lubes. He knows the how to run an auto body shop, comes to Arlo, gets a $50,000 loan. Which I started crying when he got the loan. I just started crying. This is a film that's not just about something that makes you frustrated or angry. It just makes you happy and, right. and deeply connected to these lives that, that folks like Arlo is able to touch. And I just wanted to, to check in for a second because if I understand this cor correctly, some of the funds that Arlo is dispersing are grants. They, so he is he is receiving charitable support as well as support from the Fed. So he's making loans that get repaid. And some of these loans are they're not loans, they're grants and they're not meant to be repaid. In a sense, he's operating as also as a community foundation, if you think about it. Is that is that an accurate description of the the how the money flows? Yes. Okay. Arlo opens up a financial institution, but the level of need in the community and the, 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 the level of emergency need in the community is off the charts. And so Arlo has people coming who you see in the film, but it's a common occurrence, whether it's because their apartment building burned down or it is because their car is broken down, whatever it is, there is an emergency need. And Arlo has been empowered to make these emergency grants. The Winter Rockefeller Foundation gives tremendous support to Arlo to make these emergency grants because Arlo, just because of the respect and the notoriety that he has developed, people who should be often recipients, benefits from social service agencies are, are not, again, because of structural problems in our, in our society. And Arlo is just somebody who it, the need is right in front of him. It's an emergency. And so he has funds, it's not just the Winthrop Rockefeller, it's others, so that he can make these grants. So, okay. So I'm going to jump in here with a little bit of, uh, I don't know what I want to call it, bloviating about what foundations can do and probably should do. For starters, we've had this long conversation. 
over the years about the 95% of most foundations capital sits in an account earning interest or whatever it earns. And so that they can pay out the 5% in the form of grants to organizations. And many folks have spoken about the challenge with that it will be charitable, we'll call it a challenge. But it also seems that you could take some of that 95%. If you're an organization, a foundation that believes in justice, if you believe in equity, if you believe in providing community support and all that kind of stuff, it feels like you ought to be able to take some of that 95% of capital and invest it into institutions like Arlo's Times Acrylion in any, almost any community in this country. It seems like a real obvious opportunity. And I think that for all the foundation folks who listen to this podcast, I would urge you first to see this film and to be inspired by what is possible. If Arlo, you know, Arlo has this incredible ability to see what is possible. And I think we all should be able to learn from him about that. Now, the second part is what film does and how this medium is so extraordinary. You could have written a white paper that would have had zero effect. But instead, you've told this story of an extraordinary human being who's making a difference, and you're teaching us about the issue underneath it. Can you just spend a few minutes talking about the alchemy of documentary film? Well, I think that the simplest way to describe what I do is that I take people places they otherwise would never go to meet people they would otherwise never meet. And I, I work in this highly emotional medium camera when handled artfully by great cinematographers and Tony Hardman did an incredible job shooting this film. The ability to disappear in a room where life is unfolding and complicated life and people who are willing to open up about their deepest challenges. And we knew that if we had Arlo's trust and it, there's no documentary without trust, it is entirely built on trust relationships. And so it started with winning Arlo's trust. And then by extension, Arlo brought that trust into every room that he was in. And you knew that you we were confident that the people who were coming to see Arlo or anyone he was interacting with would feel comfortable with the presence of the camera. And they would forget that the camera is there. And so that's what when we are able to spend enough time, and we did shoot 400 hours over the course of a year, you are able to capture enough moments that the film is basically a sequence of moments strung together in a way that tells something larger. It, it not only, yes, it captures the moment when Terrence finds out he gets his $50,000 loan, but because of what comes before and what comes after, it is saying something large, and it's communicating that this moment is much more than $50,000 for one auto lake anecdote shop. It is that in the Black community, there is a man who was able to create opportunity for people in his community that otherwise would never have that opportunity. Terrence, because of other aspects of his life, would not qualify for a loan from a traditional financial institution. Arlo is the only place he could have gone for that money. So we are saying so much more than just about one loan. And circling back to my approach to this art form, which is not, it's not typical, actually, in that I'm committed to it being solution-oriented, what Arlo is doing is eminently replicable. And you ask about... What can be done with film? Well, you could write a white paper about how, how to open a CDFI and no one would read it and no one would really understand what is the character that is necessary to do what Arlo does. And you see that there are Arlo's in every community. They can see this film and they could say, I didn't know about this. I could do that. And they could learn from Arlo. And then you can... You, the film just starts conversations. It opens hearts and minds to possibility. One of the beautiful things about documentary is that most often we are dealing with really tough subject and subjects and they're topics that people are often uncomfortable 
starting to talk about. So what happens is you have, you can talk about Arlo. You don't have to talk about yourself, you can talk about Arlo. And Arlo becomes the common denominator in the conversation. Everyone can express his or her reaction and, and, and how the film impacted them. And then you can start talking about your own community. You can start talking about the challenges. In your life. And that's one of the rewards of doing what I do is that I get to make these films that start important conversations. And another kind of plug to our brethren and sistren in the philanthropy community, maybe consider funding one fewer white paper and one more documentary because the stories are the things that we remember. They're the things that settle in our lipids. They're the things that kept us from getting eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. And they're the things that will carry us through to the future. And you, you have told this story about sort of the George Bailey of Little Rock in, in Arlo, Washington. But uh, John, also, I would say that you are the George Bailey to me. And I deeply appreciate you and your work and the work of your co-director, Christine Turner. Thank you so much for making this film. Thank you for speaking with us. And I can't wait to talk to you, you know, after the Oscars, <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Eric, you know, what you do and the sensitivity and the compassion you bring to uh, your work, we all benefit from. And so I can't thank you enough for inviting me on and I treasure you and all you do with this podcast. Well, it's a love fest. John Hoffman, thank you again. And we're back. How do you get to hang out with all the cool people? I love that John's back on the <laughs> podcast. I love that we're here in Oscar season. This has been Oscar nominated. And um, here's John going at it again with another great uh, addition to his incredible IMDb, by the way. Go check out the John Hoppin IMDb, and you're going to see a lot of really good work on there that John's been involved with. Yes, John has multiple, multiple Emmys, but no Oscars. And uh, this is this is so exciting. I, sadly, I, I tried to help raise some money for, for this film, and I failed. <laughs> Had I, I, w- I would have been an Oscar nominated producer oh you would have been a producer <laughs> that's awesome but if i had raised enough money i'd have been a producer <laughs> well this is a story this is one of those stories that is so layered in terms of what we do yeah. as people who work in philanthropy or nonprofits or communications for that matter yep. because a arlo is such a fascinating character and a wonderful guy and an example of how a community can build on itself and how, you know, yes, it's true that here's one guy who came up with a great idea and is moving things forward, but it's not about one guy. This is not about somebody who comes in and solves and saves every, everybody's lives or solves everyone's problems. It's about a community coming together to make itself better, to build on its great assets. I mean, this is like kind of the ultimate example of asset framing as Trabian Shorter's mm would talk about our all of our guests seem to be talking to each other but it's just such a wonderful story and i also i think i i made a little comment there that if you know we produced one fewer research project and one more documentary <laughs> we, would, we you know we might have a little better chance of a getting the message out b encouraging people about new things that they wouldn't have otherwise known about and see kind of uh, telling great stories that make a difference. Well, and John picks up where he's been working with all these very interesting and thoughtful topic areas, and this time working with Christine Turner on Barbara of Little Rock. And you could almost view this as much as anything as a piece on post-presidential communications, because what's at the center of the story, the Community Development Financial Institution Fund. That's a mouthful. The Community Development (laughs) Financial Institution Fund. And sure enough, the Clinton Center is going to be screening this film because this is a positive piece of policy that carries on from the Clinton administration aimed at trying to drive dollars into uh, communities that otherwise are systemically cut out of this process. And here you have Arlo Washington. What what a perfect character on which to build this story of first I'm a barber, I'm deeply situated in my community, and then I read some legislation and now I'm ready to roll out this whole new people's trust in my community in Little Rock. What a story and what a person. And, and, and I kept thinking this to be like 
deep history documentary. No, this is happening right now. This is this is a snapshot of what's been happening over the past 10 and 20 years in this community. Now, here's another thing. Ooh, that's another thing that I that I'm reminded of, which is if, you, if you're a foundation and you have an endowment and uh, most foundations do have endowments, why don't you maybe take some of that endowment money and put it into one of these institutions or help somebody start one and, and support it? I mean, this is there are so many things that the money does. And uh, yes, it's true that you could take 5% of it and put it into nonprofit organizations while the other 95% sits there, basically. And these are assets that are clearly making a difference. So that's just one more thing that a foundation can do with its money to advance ideas like this that are clearly making a difference, that are absolutely building wealth. They are beginning to redress historical deprivations, policies that were designed to let people out, to exclude them from opportunity. Yeah, these are... These communities that have been systemically left out of the financial system. So so the Barber of Little Rock, it's not just documentary, but it's documentary short. So this is a 35-minute long piece that New Yorker is involved with, and you can see it on YouTube. It's for free. Talk to me, Eric, about first documentary, but also short documentary, because I, I love this idea of condensing these stories down to these very powerful, impactful timeframes and frameworks. You can just click this on, see it on your computer, see it wherever you're going to see your YouTube content. And boom, you've got this incredible gift of what's been covered here by John and Christine. Well, there are so many different there are many different ways to tell stories. You can go into the movies and you can see a feature like film, or you can produce something in a in a package like this, which presumably has greater opportunity to for more eyeballs, for sure. It doesn't have the kind of financial you know, you always want to be the inconvenient, inconvenient truth or one of these great, you know, documentaries that makes a lot of money. But that's not the point. The point is to tell a story. And John tells a great John and Christine tell a great story about a fabulous person. And I want everybody within the sound of our voice to go. We will obviously link to it on the website, but to go and, and hear this story. And if you work in a foundation, figure out how can I support this type of storytelling. Well, I love how John talks about this. He likes to take people to places you otherwise wouldn't go, to meet people you wouldn't otherwise meet. This is the purpose of documentary. So I'm listening to you guys talk. I'm checking out this stuff, looking at all the reviews, and I'm thinking to myself, given that we live in an era where video is ubiquitous because we all have access to it, why are we writing anymore? Why are we writing? Like you (laughs) talked about this from the standpoint of foundations. Invest in people's trusts, also invest in documenting work like this. But why isn't the primary form of communication we're using between us and our constituents, us and our funders, why are we doing all this by video? What's, what is the, where's the written word? And I'm sure some of our past guests are just, you know, uh, up in arms oh about God. this comment because we've got some great writers and some great journalists, some written word journalists uh, that have been on the podcast in the past. But isn't there part of you that's like, why are we writing anymore? Why are we just talking about these stories, <laughs> telling these stories, using video, using audio? Why isn't this, why isn't this where we're living? A, I think 10 or 15 people just unsubscribe. <laughs> From the podcast, <laughs> myself included. I'm not listening anymore. Yeah. You're talking rot. I don't know. I mean, we, of course, we write because that we've been writing and reading for thousands of years. <laughs> so there's that. I mean, we're kind of good at it. <laughs> and it's a useful way to communicate. I mean, I, I think one of the, the other points are that you got to do everything. Mm. And different people get information in different ways. And mm. different things obtain in different ways. Stick in in different ways. And you kind of have to do everything. Mm. And I don't know. I think words are beautiful. I love them. And speaking them is nice. And seeing video is good. And reading them on the paper is good. I am a. I print stuff out. I'm like one of those true troglodytes living in the side of the cave. I print things out and I have to sit back if I want to read it and understand it. I can't just lean in, into a screen. And yeah, it's true. I, I love film. I love film. And uh, film didn't love me, but I loved it. <laughs> and so I think it's a great medium. And and the very short stuff, of course, we, we all decry the whatever the two minute attention span of TikTok, but there's value in there too, for sure. Well, I guess the bottom line is with intention and strategy behind it, clear eyes, clear eyes on our goals. It's really an all the above strategy across all this, right? It's like you want to deliver totally. it's all these tactics in whatever way it makes the most sense. There's one thing I wanted to talk about. Mm. 
There's this film I, I read about in the New York Times called Mr. Bates versus the Post Office. It's a, <laughs> it's a, a um, scripted film starring Toby Jones as this guy who uh, worked at the post office in the UK. And he, he's playing a real person who was uh, charged with fraud because there was, for one reason or another, they didn't have their accounting right in the UK post office. And he and all these other postmasters most people were were charged with fraud and they couldn't get their fraud charges expunged <laughs> until this film came out and then in a week wow. the the british wow. government like decades this this guy has been fighting the the british government of this and this film comes out and people's like oh my god look at what's going on to these poor people and what they would've been fighting for decades about in a week got fixed because of a film so we respond to these types of media. They tell stories and they communicate with us that move us to action in ways that other media don't. And that's why I think this film is wonderful. If if f- 10 communities don't start community banks right. like Arlo's after seeing the, you know after this film comes out and hopefully after it wins an Oscar, I will be shocked <laughs> because that's how stuff happens sometimes. And what a gift that would be. Well, man, John and Christine, thank you so much. This is Barbara of Little Rock. We hope, fingers crossed, best wishes for your Oscar campaign. We hope you get your Oscar. And oh. Eric, thank you for bringing John on the podcast. That was awesome, awesome, awesome. Go find it. Check it out, Barbara of Little Rock. Well, thanks, and see you next time. Okay, everybody, that's it for this episode. Please let us know if you have any thoughts about what you heard today or people we should have on this show, and that definitely includes yourself. And we'd like to thank our indefatigable producer, Harper Brown, John Ali, the tuneful and inspiring composer of our theme music, our sponsor, the Lumina Foundation. And please check out Lumina's terrific podcast, Today's Students, Tomorrow's Talent, and you can find that at luminafoundation.org. We certainly thank today's guest and, of course, all of you. And most importantly, thank you, Mr. Brown. Oh, no, 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 no. Thank you, Mr. Brown. (laughs) Okay, everybody. Until next time.